Oh my gracious. Yep. How about that? With the second pick in the 2011 NFL Draft, the Denver Broncos select Von Miller, linebacker, Texas A&M. He's the greatest ever, huh? And then I just wanted when you got all the advantages. Welcome to the Aggie War Pod, a product of the Republic of Football Podcast Network and Dave Campbell's Texas Football. I am your co-host, Mike Craven, senior writer at DCTF. The other voice you'll hear on this podcast is a barbecue-eating machine who won't shy away from a road trip or an off-key rendition of Creed. The former fight in Texas Aggie defensive lineman arrived in College Station as a three-star prospect back in 2013. He now resides in Houston, but his heart never left. Ladies, gentlemen, Reveille, I present the one, the only. Jay Arnold. Oh man, what a what a road trip I had this week. Uh, but but we're more concerned with the results on this show. So uh a lot to talk about with that in mind. A lot to talk about, not not most of it being good other than your road trip and, and the fun you had over the weekend. For those new to the show, we we divide everything into four downs, kind of like a football drive. And first down, we'll talk about that 20 to 13 loss to Tennessee in week seven. And second down, we'll talk about bigger topics, kind of Jimbo Fisher, what his future is, the road concerns. And third down, we'll look at the rest of the season and just kind of recalibrate our expectations and what we think is ahead for the Aggies in the final five games of the year. And then the fourth down, we will talk to Jay in the Ask Jay segment about his last road trip, about an upcoming road trip. And also about if people are as good at making barbecue as they think they are in their backyard. Before we get going, uh, please rate, subscribe, tell a friend, those five star stuff that bumps us up like in, in, in the algorithm and all that kind of stuff. You know, spread the word. Your help uh, gets that done a lot easier than, than us just, t- you know, screaming it into the void. If you have it, if you need some more AM gear or just some AM gear or any gear really uh, in college football across the nation, Please go to homefieldapparel.com with promo code WHOOP, W-H-O-O-P. You get 15% off of your first order from homefieldapparel.com, and we appreciate their sponsorship. If you'd like to sponsor the Aggie War Pod, uh, connect with Jay, connect with me on social media or anywhere you can find us, and we can make that happen as well. Jay, let's get into it. Let's get into the nitty-gritty. First down. Tennessee beats Texas A&M 20 to 13 A&M now on a two game losing streak and four and three overall on the season two and two in SEC play for the second straight game A&M scores only three points in the second half defense played excellent only really allowed 13 points in the, in the game uh, one of those touchdowns was on a 39 yard punt return that proved to be the difference Max Johnson had his first real bad game uh, as a starting quarterback so far in 2023 16 of 34 223 yards, zero touchdowns, two interceptions. The team only ran for 54 yards total on offense on 28 carries. That's 1.9 yards a carry. Obviously, the offensive line uh, felt like the the talking point coming out of that game. We'll talk about the PFF grades and some of that stuff uh, going forward. But, Jay, you were in the stands. You were there uh, as an away visitor uh, at Nayland Stadium You know, in Knoxville. Kind of what were your thoughts in the stands? Where did it go wrong? Uh, well, I think you already touched on it. The offensive line uh, was the biggest issue. And then really special teams have also continued to be an issue. Uh, missed field goal once again. And then also, as you mentioned, the punt return for a touchdown. Uh, I mean, a and just, they haven't been able to get anything going offensively in the second half as well. Uh, and that's the other thing, right? Uh, adjustments. Uh, we, we talked about it last week. Seems like a and just didn't adjust and Alabama did. Uh, it seemed like a similar story here against Tennessee. Although, you know, at, at least to to A and M's credit, the defense did do a pretty good job of containing uh, Tennessee, given the the turnovers and and the advantageous field position that that the Volunteers tended to have. Uh, I mean, it, it's just if you're not scoring but three points in the, in the second half, it's going to be tough to win games. And, you know, some of that is the offensive line. Some of that is the play calling. Some of it is lack of adjustments. I mean, it's there. There's a lot that's not going well. Uh, and it seems like anytime A&M runs into a very good opponent, uh, this is going to be the same story. 
I wanted to ask you about those adjustments because on paper that that absolutely looks like an issue. Three points again in, in the second half, same as Alabama in a game that you can win, right? I mean, you give up that few, you give up twenty points in twenty twenty three modern football, you should win most football games, right? Uh, it's not like you're playing against the eighty five Bears. Tennessee, you know, isn't Alabama defensively. You know, even though they're good, they have some talent. You know, they're not you know one of the murderer rose defenses you're going to face. And so your defense holds them to twenty, really holds them to thirteen. Uh, you should walk out of that uh with a win but i wanted to ask you about these adjustments as somebody who's played football what it looks like to me and again i i know nothing so this is just my just my outsider view of it it looks like in the first half petrino fisher or or kind of are scheming it up to to hide the offensive line you know with the script and just what they're doing they're figuring out ways to surprise the defense and, and hide the offensive line problems but as the game goes on how much can you hide that, right? Like eventually it just feels like Alabama and Tennessee, we're better on the defensive line. They can't block us. They can't protect the quarterback. And it felt like, like what can, what adjustments can you make when your offensive line is struggling that much, I guess is my real question. Well, I think the biggest thing is, I, I don't know that the offensive styles that uh, Jimbo and, and Bobby Petrino run as different as they may be. I don't know that, either of their offensive styles lends themselves towards uh, taking advantage of or high masking that offensive line. Uh, Cause I think there's a few things that you can do, but you know, some of that's RPO where you're, you're, you know, getting rid of the ball quickly anyway. Uh, and, and you have reads that you're, you're basing off of the defensive line. Uh, you know, there's some quick game with, with slants and things of that nature, but it just seems like AM hasn't mixed any of that in. Uh, and, you know, maybe there is stuff that can mask the offensive line. Maybe you just go full max pro and and keep tight ends and and go shot plays from there. But I, I just with wanting to push the ball downfield and the lack of protection that AM's you know uh, creating and the fact that they can't really establish a run game either against good teams. There's really not much you can do, uh, especially with the style of offense that that it seems like AM would prefer. Uh, you know, really, the Aggies are lucky that defensively, that that unit is performing well enough to keep them in games, and the games haven't gotten worse. Because uh, if this is the defense from last year, I don't know that that A and M is close uh, as far as you know not being able to slow down the run. And to be fair to Tennessee as well, they also had success in the run game this week and at a rate that we haven't really seen anybody yet. And I do want to give them credit for that, but yeah, it just feels like you. Within their scheme, a And M really can't do much to mask the problems with the offensive line, and I mean, it, it's it seems like it's progressively gotten worse through the season as well. Is the other thing, uh, and I don't know if you know people are more banged up than than a And M is letting on. Uh, I don't know if it's just there's such a disconnect between the personnel and what a and wants to do offensively. Uh, but there's just, I mean, it's it's just obvious that the offensive line is the Achilles heel of this team right now. I don't know where you stand on PFF grades. I can kind of go back and forth. I think they're a good tool. I wouldn't take the numbers to be an exacto measurement of what the A&M coaches or what a real coach would sit there and grade an offensive line. But I just want to go left tackle to right tackle, the individual grades along the offensive line against Tennessee. Left tackle, 50.2. Left guard, 54.8. Center, 34.1. Right guard, 65.3. Right tackle, 54.8. You can't win many football games with that, right? Even if that's not an exact number and what do those numbers mean, that means the offensive line isn't playing pretty well. And it's not just one or two guys. It's the whole group. The backups grades weren't much better than that. And I guess that's why maybe I shouldn't give Petrino a pass in this offensive pass because we've seen it enough at this point. But it just feels like they run out of bullets. Like, you know, they're just there's not much you can do when the offensive line is performing that way. And you have a backup quarterback and your wide receivers are, are beat up. I don't think Evan Stewart's 100 percent. You know, Noah Thomas has been in and out of the lineup. Anaya Smith, slot receiver. You're missing your best tight end and Donovan Green, or at least, you know, going into the season, what we thought was your best tight end going into Donovan Green. And it feels like the first half, they're they're able to mask that relatively. 
it's not like they're going out there and scoring 31 points, but they're moving the football. They're scoring some points. They're being in positions to win football games. And it feels like the defense is able to make those adjustments based on what A&M is doing. And A&M just doesn't have the horses up front to counter the adjustments, to adjust off the adjustments is kind of what it looks like to me. I'd love to give truth serum to Petrino and Fisher and just ask them, what do you do? What do you think you can do? Right. And, and, you can't run the football. You can't protect for deep passing stuff after after the after uh, after you can't run the football. And so, uh, it just feels like a hard time to be an offensive coordinator. I do not feel uh, jealous of Petrino and Fisher trying to figure out ways um, to do this because I just from every offensive coach I know, it all starts up front. And if you can't block them, like what do you call? Yeah, yeah, and and that's pretty much what the issue was that I saw on Saturday. Uh, I just, I mean, I'm kind of at a loss for words because I, don't, I, I don't understand how this unit has it seemingly regressed yeah. the past two years. Uh, I mean, the only thing you can really point to is is position coaching. So, uh, you know, maybe the talent's not there, but I, I just, I just don't know if I buy that based on how they performed as freshmen. Uh, right. The talent may not be there to like be a dominant unit. But the talent's absolutely there to be better than the grades I just read off. Like those are exactly. four and five star guys who have played a lot of football that we've seen their upside be good. Like we've seen the good from them enough to know that it's there somewhere. That's why you get paid a few hundred thousand dollars. You know, like that comes down to coaching. And if it's in it, even if it's a talent issue, that also comes down to coaching because who yeah. brought the guys there? And so, yeah. you know, if you bring the guys there, you're in charge of developing them and you're in charge of the game plan on Saturday, there's like nowhere else to look than the sideline. Yep, and I mean, it, it's frustrating because I, I want to see these guys do well, and I know how hard it is in the SEC, and this is the part where the former player in me comes out where, you know, I, I've been part of a unit that was heavily criticized. Our defense in 2013 couldn't stop anybody. Right. Uh, and, and you know, I, I'm a part of that, and I, I've seen, you know, it's it's not necessarily fun to hear all the, the talk about you failing to perform, but at the end of the day, I mean, those guys are going to be more upset with themselves than, than any of us online are. Uh, Cause I think they expect better out of themselves as well. And, and like you said, those grades from PFF, not an exact science, but uh, the amount of pressure that, that Max Johnson was under constantly uh, the fact that the AM offense only averaged 1.9 yards rushing uh, both of those things kind of lend themselves to the same conclusion that, uh, you just can't win games when your offensive line is struggling this this much. Do you feel that either of these last two games, and specific the second half, are any different if Connor Wegman's healthy, or is that just the offensive line's been bad and you know is Wegman's not that much better than Max Johnson to where he was going to make up for that? I do think Wegman is is better at getting rid of the ball quick. I think that's one area that may have helped out a little bit, but I mean it's. It's pulling teeth at that point, right? Like, <laughs> as as an offensive line, like you still have to protect your guy. And really, I think a is kind of lucky that that Max Johnson hasn't gotten injured as well uh, with the amount of hits that he's taken. Uh, so he maybe things up. are he was beat up yeah. on Saturday. Yeah, maybe things are a little bit different if Wegman's in there. But uh, like I said, I mean, it's still like not good because you're not establishing the run and and. There's just nothing to take the pressure off. I just think that, you know, it was only a matter of time before Wegman went down in hindsight with the amount of, of hits that the quarterbacks are taking here. Uh, so, I, again, I, I don't see Wegman making that much of a difference. I think his quick release may have helped a little bit, but uh, it, I just I, I don't see a lot. Yeah, and you know, I talk about this like with Baylor right now and Dave Aranda and the defensive side of the ball in Waco. Your team can't be this bad on the side of the football that your head coach is the specialist for, right? Like Texas yeah. can't be bad offensively with Steve Ar- Sarkeesian as the head coach, or why is he the head coach? Like Ole Miss can't be offensively with Lane Kiffin as the head coach, or why is he the head coach? Dave Aranda can't be bad defensively, or why is he the head? Why is he the head coach? Jimbo Fisher's an offensive guy, right? That that's his side of the ball. Um, and they haven't been very good there. Before we move down to second down and start talking more about Jimbo and the coaching staff, I do want to give the flowers to the defense because uh, they were excellent. Like you hold Tennessee to 13 points on the road, you should win 99% of those football games. Um, it sucked to see Walter Nolan get hurt. 
Uh, he looked really emotional when he got hurt, which to me always kind of signifies that it's, it's a little bit bigger than just well, a sprained that, ankle or something. And and him being in his hometown, too. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And he was balling. And he's been great, you know. And we talked about this a little bit on, on the last show, but <laughs> you kind of worry a, there could be a schism developing here between the defense and the offense when one unit is performing at a, you know, a conference championship level and the other side is just so clearly not holding their – their uh, side of the bargain, because as much as we kind of, you know, crapped on DJ Durkin and that defense over the first couple of weeks, they've been the bright spot uh, of Texas A&M during SEC play, and they've deserved better the last two weeks. Yeah. And the, and the secondary stepped up this week, I think, Uh, I mean, really good performance for them. Uh, But yeah, I mean, I don't think there's going to be a schism that develops just because you come in with guys and, and, you know, you go through that, that suffering all together anyhow. Uh, you know, sometimes, I mean, there's always going to be disagreements between offense and defense because you have to practice against those guys. And then, uh, it gets, it gets annoying seeing the same faces every day, but <laughs> right. I, don't, I, I don't see a schism developing just because of, of that. Uh, obviously there's going to be frustration, right? Cause the defense has been performing well and, and, and the offense, uh, has not, uh, it was the same thing for me. Like I already touched on where, I was on the defensive side of the equation. We weren't performing while the offense was was taking care of business. Uh, really, you just kind of encourage your guys. Uh, for us, it was the offensive guys like just trying to get us pumped up, and, and I think the defense is doing the same thing here uh, for the A and M offense. It's just there's only so much you can do, and uh, it doesn't help anybody to to really get frustrated and and, and angry uh, and and yelling on the sidelines because. They're not executing. Like as a as a team, it, there's going to be that frustration. You may talk about it in the locker room, but it, it just doesn't help anybody out there. And I, I think, you know, there's still a lot of growing for college kids to do. But for the most part, you play enough football, you you recognize uh, the issue there, and and you're not going to contribute to a schism. Uh, a couple really, uh, a couple of young players playing really well. Torian York with with nine tackles on PFF. He's the second best graded linebacker against the run in the country. Like <laughs> kids ball it. Doesn't look like a true freshman. Doesn't look like a three star for sure. I mean, looks looks like a superstar. Looks like a future NFL player. He's really sheared up uh, that second level. DJ Hicks, uh, the five star uh, defensive lineman from from Katy Pato. Uh, with his half, we got a half sack against Tennessee. So uh, that defensive line has been great. The front seven overall has been great. As you mentioned, the secondary played maybe it's pe- best game of, of the year against an offense that can be explosive. Tennessee has been a better running team this year than passing team uh, with Milton and just the, their lack of weapons outside. Brew McCoy was hurt, uh, but still uh, to hold a Josh Heupel offense to 13 points, uh, no matter how you do that, uh, you deserve to win the football game. And so uh, the defense was playing great. Just wanted to, to kind of talk about them a little bit. It's so easy to talk about the bad stuff and forget about a couple of the good things that that unit deserves um, some praise for their their play over the last couple of weeks, even with two losses. Second down here, we'll go into the more of the big topics. Let's get into the fun stuff, Jay Arnold. Uh, I am just a sports writer, so this is the stuff I love to do and stir the <laughs> pot and talk about theoretical conversations when it's not my money. Uh, Jimbo Fisher has now lost eight straight road games. The last road win for the Aggies was on October 16th, 2021 against Missouri. As a former player, I want to ask you, what the hell is that about? Well, it's not a, not a, it's always going to be a challenge to win on the road, right? Especially in the SEC. But uh, you would think at least one of those road contests, you'd pull off a win. Uh 2021. It's I mean it's it's two years and it's against a Mizzou team that was not particularly good. Uh look, I mean I could point to the fact that that AM has a really good home field advantage and that other schools in the SEC have really good home field advantages, but at the end of the day it, it comes down to execution and uh it just seems like execution has kind of been lacking on the road. It's almost like you're relying on that that home field advantage a little bit too much and uh I mean, to win games in, in this conference, you need to be able to to get a couple road wins in there. And, you know, things don't get easier as well, looking ahead on the schedule. You still have at Ole Miss and at LSU, both going to be very hostile environments. Uh, so things, things are not, you know, it, it, the current trend, you would hope that at least one of those ends up being a win. But, I mean, the way the offense has performed, I just don't see that happening. So, uh, you know, a lot of the same 
is what I, I would expect here. But as far as why AM isn't winning on the road, I, I don't know. I don't know. Like, again, two years straight of, of no road wins. Uh, I don't know if it's a focus issue. I don't know if there's something in the, uh, in the in the pregame ritual that needs to change, uh, if if there's something where a And M just really struggles uh, logistically, I, I just you have to be able to win road games, and 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 two years of not doing that is obviously a big issue. Yeah, it's hard to know without being in the building. Kind of if if it's a coaching thing, if it's an organizational thing, if it's a you know just a coincidence thing. It's not like they're. 10 and two otherwise, right? You know, they're, they're losing a decent amount of games the last two years. And so you're going to lose the ones on the road. Uh, but yeah, I just, how hard is it to play on the road? Like, is that an overblown thing by fans and, and media that the, the playing on the road or, you know, is there some real issues or some real uh, hurdles in, in getting ready for a road game compared to a home game? Well, cause I know I, some players that like to play on the road. Yeah. I, some I coaches that it. like to play on the road. I enjoy it because you know you get to get in there and 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 disappoint an opposing crowd. It's fun. Right. You kind of have that chip on your shoulder, uh, and defensively as well. Like it, it, the the advantage, sure. Like it's a lot more difficult to play on the road as an offense than it is as a defense, in my yeah, opinion. That makes sense. Now you get a you get a bigger boost as a defense at home, but at the end of the day, like you're you're not having fans yell and 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 keep you from getting signals in uh, when when you're a defense on the road. So it, it's I don't think it affects you as much as it affects the offense when they go on road trips. And I mean, look, I I heard that crowd and and saw how much of a struggle it was to get communication in. Home field advantage is definitely a thing, uh, but again, it, it affects offenses traveling more than it does defenses. Uh, I just, you know, it's. Part of me is just soaking in those environments and and really enjoying it, and part of me is like saying, "Oh man, if I was on offense right here, I would be miserable." Right. Uh, trying to make sure, you know, like I'm not false starting or or uh, getting the wrong signal in just because it's so oppressively loud. Uh, when a good team has a whole bunch of fan support on the road, I mean, it's it definitely plays plays a role in uh, the offensive struggles in my mind. It feels like consistency, communication, execution are all issues for the Texas A&M offense, and maybe those are just exaggerated when you're on the road. And so problems that are probably true at home but maybe don't rear their head as much because the crowd is with you all of a sudden become really big points on the road. And then also when your special teams isn't great either um, and you're allowing special teams points, free points coming off that stuff, and you can't overcome two poor units, right? you got to win at least two of the three phases of the football game on the road and, and A&M's at best winning one of those uh, right now. And so that, that lends itself to that. Like you mentioned, Ole Miss on the road, LSU on the road, there is real danger here that, that Jimbo and this Aggie team goes to 0 10 in their last 10 games on the road without a road win in 2022 or 2023. That's a real possibility there. <clears throat> Let's talk about the elephant in the room, Jay, uh, the $76.8 million elephant in the room. Uh, that is how much Texas A&M would owe Jimbo Fisher uh, if he is bought out uh, during this season or after this season. That number drops down to 67.55 after 2024. So really only $10 million saved if you fire him after. Only. only. <laughs> if you, it's not my money. Again, I, I preface that yeah. up front. It's not my <laughs> money. Again, I was at S- – this is what changed. I've always been somebody who didn't think this buyout was possible. Like that's just too much money. I can't wrap my head around that. I follow oil prices. I know where things are going. Like <laughs> there's no way you got that kind of excess money. And then SMU joined the AA or the ACC without taking any media rights deal. And, and Bill Mercer, their kind of head guy there, that's that's raising that money that made that thing work. In a conversation with me, told me, dude, it's a hundred million dollars. We're not sweating a hundred million dollars. And if that is true at SMU. Right. Like if, if SMU's donors are like, dude, it's a hundred million dollars. We're not, we're not going to lose any sleep over a hundred million dollars. I'd imagine AM doesn't either. And so for me, this feels like this is in play. And when you look at it, you're only saving again, only I, I realize what I'm saying here, but you're only saving nine or $10 million by waiting a year. It is not a matter of when Jimbo Fisher gets bought out of this contract or not a matter of if Jimbo Fisher gets bought out of the contract. It is when he is not making it to the end. I think we can all just, Declare declare that as truth. He is going to get fired at some point. A and M is going to have to buy buy him out. Do you just pull the plug and go for it, 
or do you let this thing play out another year, knowing that Texas is coming, knowing that the SEC is only going to get better? Do you try to get in front of the coaching uh, coaching search and just get this thing going and rip the Band-Aid off? Or do you hope and pray that this young and unbelievably talented team figures it out next year and you give them one more ride with this recruiting class going into their third year? The the issue that I worry about is I, I think with the talent that AM has on hand, uh a new coach coming in can win right away. Uh and you have to wonder if some of that just galvanizes the team. You know, obviously if 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 Fisher moves on, uh or if AM moves on from from Jimbo, uh it, it's with a transfer portal, you worry about keeping the core together, right? Yeah. Like uh, I think that's a little bit of the worry, uh, but man, you go it, hire Mike I mean, Elko and none of those defensive guys are leaving. No, no, they aren't. Uh, but you know, it, it's a matter of who they, who they can get, who wants to take that role. Cause you obviously know, you know, after Jimbo Fisher has his exit, uh, the standard is, is very high. Mm-hmm. And it's not going to be an easy place to win, no matter what, uh, just because you have so many factors. Uh, you have so many teams that are coming into Texas to recruit, it makes it difficult to get the guys out of there. Uh, but you also have, you know, a, a, one of the toughest conferences in the country. And you know you're going to a place where people expect to compete for conference titles and national titles, reasonable or not. Uh and that's a lot of pressure. Uh, I mean, it, it's a it's a tough place. By the same token, though, you have the resources. Yes, uh, A and is always going to be a place that has the resources, the money to win. Uh, and, and I think that's only going to increase with with the NIL era and, and transfer portal. Uh, so it's, I don't know if you rip the band aid off yet. Uh, you know, I me personally, I think he should get at least the chance to finish the season. Sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You're not going to fire. Well, the only reason you'd fire him in the middle of the season is because the coaching landscape changes so quickly. Yeah. That you want to be first in line. Well, right? and, you, and and now you have, I mean, the early signing period. And, right. and I mean, there are a lot of factors. Uh, but short of losing to Abilene Christian, I don't think there's a reason to 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 really fire a coach midseason. Uh I mean, who knows though? Like the other, the flip side of that too is like you talked about it with the, with SMU boosters. Uh, A and M boosters have a lot of ego. I mean, a a ton, a ton of ego. Uh, so if they feel like they're being <laughs> disrespected, uh, which is so dumb to me, but we we don't have to get into all of that. <laughs> uh, they will move quickly, and and they will get it done. Uh, like you said, I, I don't think the the buyout's an issue for for the. Uh, folks with wealth at around the AM program. Uh the buyout's only a, an issue from a optics standpoint. Yeah. It it looks bad to pay somebody 80 million dollars to go away. Especially uh, when you gave them a plaque with a blank year on it that said national champions. Uh right. That's which, the part that's the part that I think would make AM pause is as you mentioned the ego. You don't yeah. you don't want to be the quote unquote laughing stock of college football. And when that move is made, there are going to be jokes everywhere you look on social media. Yeah. But if you're AM, I don't think you can let the buyout concern you. If no. you would fire Jimbo Fisher if he was owed $10 million, you need to fire him if he's owed $76 million. Like you are AM, you gave him this money, you have this money. If the move is to move on, move on. I do wonder. I think the I think the equation would be easier if Texas wasn't joining the SEC next year. I think that twenty maybe I'm putting too much stock into that first matchup, but it feels like both sides are positioning themselves to win that war, right? To win that first battle, that's very important. And if you're A and M, are you better off with you know some continuity and bringing them back one year, or do you just cut the cord and hope a new guy can do what Sonny Dykes did at TCU? where he can walk into an unbelievably talented roster and kind of unlock them in a way to get them to reach their potential. I would lean that way, but again, it's not, it's not my money. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm probably leaning that way as well. Uh, I mean, the flip side of it too, is I just, you know, I, and I, it's probably dumb to have empathy for someone that, that 
is getting paid millions of dollars. Correct. Uh, but <laughs> I, I just, I always think about it. Like, I mean, there are so many factors that go into running a college football program. Uh, the amount of eyes that are going to be on you, the amount of pressure, and and yes, it does come with a lot of money. And I shouldn't feel bad for somebody that's going to get paid a lot, a lot, a lot of money, and even if they get fired, uh, I would love to be in that position. But yeah. uh, all of the second guessing, I think of. There's a scene in Game of Thrones, and this is a weird way to think about it. But there's a scene in Game of Thrones where uh, the dude that's kind of the interim commander of the Night's Watch and, and Jon Snow are t- standing on top of the wall. And I just remember him like turning to Jon Snow and saying, do you know what it means to be in charge? And and he goes, D- dealing with all of the little twats that second guess you every <laughs> step of the way. And so there's part of me that's like, I mean, I get it from from a head coach standpoint but at the same time like you're getting paid all this money you gotta you gotta execute your deal so uh, and you're not likable you know it's, <laughs> like, it's like one thing when some you know some of these coaches you don't like writing the please fire that guy yeah you know but with jimbo it, it makes it easy because he's not he's not a personable guy like he's not he's not out in the community he's not making himself available for a bunch of a m fans he's not kissing babies and shaking hands and all that kind of stuff. he's not matt brown or he's not RC Slocum, right? Like yeah. he's not he's not one of those guys that you yeah you love and that you hate to see fail or whatever. If you're on the outside, uh, I think if you polled most A and M fans, you know they I don't think they have a negative opinion of Jimbo, but they don't have a positive one. It's just like win football games. You're our hired, you know, assassin or whatever. It's, a, it's a mercenary game. type deal yes. where like right you you were brought in here to win games, and you, if you don't do it, then we're we're not gonna hold up the contract. I mean, I, I just. It's an issue where you were brought in for one reason, and the one reason isn't working out. I mean, and and let's be honest here: like A and M could go on a tear, still finish the season nine three, go to a bowl game, win ten games, and I think everybody's happy. Uh, just because you'd have a ton of momentum, momentum going into next year. Theoretically, uh, Connor Wegman's back, and there's a lot to build around. Uh, the problem is, I mean. At the very least, I think you have to go in a different direction with the offensive line, and I just don't know if if Jimbo wants to do that. Uh, and that that could be another aspect of it. But like you said, I mean, things move so fast in the coaching world now, and you know, A and M fans and in general are just so disgruntled now uh, with the amount of money, and then the people that aren't the boosters don't really matter as much, but the boosters you know, have some of the same opinions as all the vocal people online. Uh, and it's just, it's, it's general feeling of restlessness where yes. it's like, look, we're paying all this money. Why aren't we getting results? Uh, and, and when your best year is the COVID year where everything kind of has an asterisk on it anyway, uh, it's, it's just generally not a, a good harbinger for the future. If you take away that COVID year, Jimbo Fisher is 34 and 23 overall and 17 and 19 in SEC play. And that's, uh, that's not good enough. Yep. Below 500 in, in conferences, just, I mean, it, it's not good. Like you said, it's not good enough. Uh, so you know, I think AM vans getting restless is also reasonable. Oh, yeah. Like, no, I, it's, I think, it's absolutely reasonable. Yeah. Uh, but again, I just, maybe it's, you know, just an inherent flaw that I am always more of a wait and see approach. And it's probably something that uh, doesn't lend itself to this type of situation where maybe you're better served by just trying to move on as quickly as possible. Uh, But I I just, I still kind of want to see how the rest of the season plays out. It's not my money. As I said, I'm not an athletic director. These people know way more than me. I'd fire them tomorrow. You know what I mean? Like that's just, if you're going to fire them after the season, you just you just yeah. rip the band-aid off and get that coaching search started and, and start it from scratch. See who wants to be there, see who doesn't. Cause if you do it in December, then all hell breaks loose with your signing yeah. class, with the transfer portal, all that stuff. Uh, and AM has a good class on hand right now. Yeah, great class. Like the talent acquisition is not the issue for this coaching staff and for that program. And that's what belie- that's what makes this problem so obvious because they are the, I think, fourth most talented roster in the country. Like Georgia, Alabama, Ohio State are the only teams with more blue chip athletes on their roster than Texas A&M. But if that was an SAT question, 
you would know the one that doesn't fit in on, on in the game results. Those other three are in the college football playoff, essentially every single season or like right there. Um, and, and A&M just simply hasn't been with that talent. I know a lot of that talent is young. I know a lot of that talent's been beat up and, and not a- absolutely healthy, but that's the breaks. Those are the, that's football. That, that's how this works. And when you get paid that kind of money and when you're at a program with these type of expectations, you just, and when your rival's getting better, you know, and it, and it's coming into and in, coming into the conference. And I think, am I wrong to say that A&M's biggest rivals are probably are like the teams they look to are LSU, Texas, maybe even Alabama these days. And if you look at those teams, um, you know, A&M's behind them and you can't, you can't be there, right? Like this is a arms race uh, and you, you can't accept that kind of stuff. And so it'll be interesting to see uh, what Texas A&M does. I'd imagine they're already kicking some tires from what I know of how these things work. They start talking to some agents and figuring out who's available and who would be and what the price would be. Because a lot of it is not only just the $80 million you got to pay to Jimbo to get away. You're going to have to pay another 20, 30, 40 million dollars for your new coaching staff, for their buyout, uh, for their assistance, all that kind of stuff. So it's probably a hundred and twenty million dollar decision uh, that AM okay. is about to put up. And so anyway, we'll see how that goes the rest of the year. I'm with you. I don't think that they fire him at the end of the year unless they just win like or lose like two or three in a row. And all of a sudden, you know, I, I think this this goes to the end of the year, or at least to like maybe that LSU game. Uh, but if they don't win another road game, it just it seems hard to bring back a coach of that payroll uh, when he hadn't run, when he hadn't run a, a won a road game uh, in over two years at that point. So double digit losing streak, right? I mean, just fat, yeah, can't isn't beating ranked teams, you know, all those kind of things, right? And so uh, we'll see how that goes. It's, it's a fascinating time. It's not a fun time, but a fascinating time to kind of figure out and watch uh, what the Aggies are going to do moving forward. Let's move to third down and look ahead at the rest of the season real quick or kind of get some thoughts on how we think the rest of the season is going to go. Uh, A&M is idle this week. That's probably a good thing. Uh, probably one of the teams that, that needs a little bit of a break to regroup, get healthy on offense, figure out what they're going to do with the offensive line. I'd be shocked if the offensive line looks the exact same going into South Carolina as it did with Tennessee. It feels like you almost have to make a change just to make a change somewhere. Um, and so we'll figure that out moving forward. Road games left against Ole Miss and LSU, as we talked about. Home games are South Carolina, Mississippi State, Abilene Christian. Uh, If A&M doesn't win at all on the road, the best that they can do is seven and five. So I'm curious kind of where you're at with like your thoughts of where this team is going to be at the end of the year now. (laughs) A ceiling of seven and five? Uh, (laughs) Realistically. uh... Because you just threw out the scenario that maybe nine and three is still, you know, I guess it technically is still on the table. Uh, but I would I would bet the child I've never had before that nine and three ain't happening. No, uh, seven and five is is I think a best case scenario. I, I throw nine and three out there as a possibility, just because mathematically speaking, it's a possibility. Sure, it is possible. But uh, seven and five is I think the ceiling right now. And uh, you know I think A and M should beat all three or should win all three of those home games. Uh, you know, South Carolina and Mississippi State representing the two SEC games left at home. Uh, neither one of those teams is great by any means, but I mean, there's still enough talent to present a threat, right? And that's why I say seven and five is the ceiling. Uh, there's a world where AM falls to six and six uh, or five and seven, even, I think, if, if, you know, thing if the wheels really come off uh and then i mean i think it's a no-brainer uh if if you lose to to south carolina and mississippi state or or i mean either one of them i think things start happening a little bit quicker uh in my mind uh but we'll see what happens obviously you know having both of those uh road games in november uh you have to wonder if you know the schedule switched around and Arkansas and Auburn were in November and the LSU and Ole Miss games were, were in September. Uh, you have to wonder if a and M's not already got five losses on the schedule. And then uh, the, the decision has been made. So, uh, but yeah, I think seven and five is, is about the ceiling. It smells like a six and six football team. Yep. You know, it just it really does. It, it, it smells like a team that's going to lose one of those road game or home games to somebody who has a big off because it feels like if you score 28 points or more against A&M, you can run and hide. 
you know, and, and yeah. one of those offenses is capable of having one of those type of games. And so um, I don't know how AM beats teams. If it gets into the thirties, that means I don't think they're going to win either of those road games. And I, I think they lose one of the home games, you know, obviously not Abilene Christian, but I think they lose to South Carolina or Mississippi state before we move on. I wanted to ask, do you think that there's a chance that this gets worse because of the bye week rather than just better? Like, are there times when you're struggling that it's good to go back in front of Kyle field and just play a home game and get this thing going rather than listening to two weeks of what they're about to listening to. I almost think at first I'm like, Oh, the bye week's perfect. They need one of those. And then the more I think about it, it's like, man, I think I'd rather just get back on the football field and have an opponent on Saturday rather than go through what you're going to go through with these dead two weeks. Yeah. You can absolutely get in your own head. I mean, right. it's, uh, it's not fun to listen to all the people <laughs> right. talk about like this kind of scenario. You never want to like, regardless how you feel, you don't want to be responsible for someone getting fired. <laughs> like yeah. you're superior you're getting fired. Uh, no matter how you feel uh, about them. Uh, it, it's not a good feeling to say, ah, well, I didn't execute my job good enough. So now uh, my coach is getting, getting canned. Uh, that's not fun to think about. Uh, so yeah, there's definitely a scenario where this bye week is uh, not necessarily beneficial for the team. Uh, you also look at like, the health side of things. And I do think a is banged up enough where from that aspect, sure. uh, getting healthier is a, is a positive for this bye week but no. Yeah. Like sometimes sitting alone in a dark room with your thoughts does not help you get better. Uh, and that could very well be the scenario that, that happens to A&M in this bye week. And you're not even by yourself. You're listening to your dad, to your bros, to your former coaches, to your friends, to your girlfriends, to your classmates. Like everybody's like, what's going on? Are they going to fire Jimbo? You know, like all that stuff. And to your point earlier about feeling bad for some of these coaches, I don't feel bad for Jimbo, but I do feel bad for the support staff and like the, the people lower on on the totem pole that get cycled out when this stuff happens, right? Like people are going to lose their job, whether it's Jimbo or other people, like heads are will roll if this team goes from five and seven to six and six. There, or there's probably going to be five. some changes this offseason, even if right, no matter Jimbo what survives, no matter yeah. what. Um, and so, you know, you never want to root. You're not rooting for any of that kind of stuff, obviously. Right. But this is a, this is a business. This isn't, this isn't intramurals, you know, <laughs> like, like they are getting paid a lot of money things are going to happen. And so, uh, yeah, it just, it does feel like a six and six, seven and five at best football team. And we talked all off season. He needed at least eight wins. Eight win, eight and four was going to get fuzzy. Uh, yeah. Nine and three was going to keep him there. Eight and four was going to get fuzzy. Anything below that's danger zone. Um, seven and five, maybe with a, with an injured quarterback, you go, hey, we'll bring in some offensive line transfers. We'll get a o- new offensive line coach. We'll have our quarterback healthy. Our defense was really good. Let's go try to win nine, ten games and compete in the SEC. Uh, but I just don't see it, man. I just it's it's hard for me to see. Uh, let's move down. Let's move to fourth down. Let's get to the Ask Jay segment of this stuff. We've been we've been too doom and gloomy here. I, I'm feeling <laughs> I'm getting down uh, just talking about this. I'm stuff. feeling like I'm in the dark room alone with my thoughts. Right, right, hundred percent, hundred percent. I am. Well, I guess I have a light on, but other than that, I am in a dark room with my thoughts most of the time. That's how I live my life as a writer. <laughs> Uh, let's get to more positive stuff. You went to one of my favorite places on Saturday. I know you didn't have a, a tremendous time. I'm sure you had a tremendous I mean, time. The end result wasn't <laughs> what you wanted it to be, but I'm sure you had a tremendous time. Knoxville is fantastic. That road trip there is an awesome drive. Overall, how do you grade that trip to Knoxville, and where does it sit in kind of your pecking orders of, of best atmospheres that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, again, I, I take AM out of the equation because I'm biased, and I think Kyle Field beats everybody. But, uh, I mean, Neyland – has to be especially with the checkerboard yeah everything that went on uh i am pinching myself that i have to see the whiteout and and neyland stadium in the same year because uh, i mean i don't know that you can get two better environments uh obviously I've, I've done death valley and lsu is is right there as well but i mean i have those three bunched together neyland uh the whiteout at penn state and then death valley on a saturday night uh I, I'm spoiled for sure. Neyland was incredible. Hearing a hundred thousand people sing Rocky Top at the top of their lungs, uh, and the people were super nice. Like yeah. the Tennessee fans were great to me. Uh, I think there's a a bit of a disconnect, and and uh, I'm not 
the one that put this thought out there originally. I think Holly Anderson was the one that that I got it from, but there's a disconnect between like Tennessee fans on Twitter and Tennessee tailgates sure. and the tailgating scene was just unreal. Everybody was super friendly offering us food, drinks, uh, advice on where to go after the game. Uh, I mean, just everything you could have wanted from a host, uh, the Tennessee volunteer fans were, uh, good to us. And you know, there's always bad apples, right? Like you're going to have sure, some, sure. some, some drunk frat bros screaming things. There, that's going to be anywhere you go. But overall, I mean, Tennessee was an incredible experience and it is immediately in my like upper echelon uh, for road trips. And I mean, the natural beauty of, of East Tennessee is only adds to that. Yeah. East Tennessee is hard to beat. I think it's important to always remember that Twitter, Twitter isn't real life um, <clears throat> today, or at least last night I had a TCU fan in our Dave Campbell's college football mentions that we only cover the small schools and not TCU. One, without the awareness that TCU is one of the small schools, it's like a small private university, right? They, they, their, their biggest sellout game of all time was this year against Colorado. It was like fifty four thousand people. It's not, <laughs> it's not like they're having one hundred eight thousand people there every single week. They're much closer to UTSA than they are at A and M in terms of like fan base wise. And then also, I turned into a damn TCU reporter last year as they were tur- running into the, you know, I, I went to the final seven TCU games. I went to the Fiesta Bowl, went to the national championship game in LA, and then we put Sunny freaking Dykes on our damn cover, yeah. right? And like, so you just got to remember that uh, Twitter isn't real life and that those people are mostly doing a bit to get a reaction and not actual <laughs> human beings that can breathe out of their nose and read without mouthing the letters as they're doing it. Yeah, and you, and you cover the stories. By the way, shout out to uh, TCU quarterback starter this past weekend, Josh Hoover, a Rockwell Heath product. Yeah. Yeah, best uh, player ever to come out of Rockwall Heath for sure. <laughs> I don't know. I'd argue Kendall Lawrence still, but uh, <laughs> no. Uh, uh, I mean, you're right though. Like that. That's why I encourage people to not base their opinions off of who you interact with online. Because every road trip game that I've gone to, every fan base that I've interacted with, I've had good experiences with. Uh, the exception being Louisville. Uh, that's the only time I've ever had an opposing fan try to fight me. It was at uh, for the Music City Bowl in 2015. Uh, that's the one fan base that I've had bad well, experiences Let's unpack with in real this. Life. Let's unpack this real <laughs> quick. Uh, this is why God made me small and not tough. Because like with my attitude, like if I was your size with like your grappling ability and things, like I would kill people. Like I'd be in prison for assault. Um, and so I'm glad that you have the demeanor that you do. Uh, did you not, did you just beat him up? Like, did you, uh, no, I, I just, I kind of walked away. I mean, you just, I would have wedged uh, you. And it's well, and sometimes the demeanor also doesn't help. Cause like the dude like rips his shirt and like flex and I'm laughing because right. at this point, this is, well, just that's calm. the most, that's how you make people more angry, you know? Yeah, like, and I, I like, I know that while it's happening, but I'm like, I gotta, I gotta <laughs> go. <laughs> right. Is it like this? This is not a scenario like West Side Story. Just, I mean, I'm like, I don't, I don't understand. But you should have uh, Uma plotted him. Yeah, hit him with a hit him with a good, good old shoulder lock and mm-hmm. uh, see what see what happens from there. But no, I mean, it's there's always going to be some bad apples. But it, like, it seemed like the Louisville fans were like there was a lot of bad apples. So I don't know. Uh, and I, I'm probably holding it against them just because it is the one time that it's happened to me. Sure. Uh, but, you know, anecdotal evidence and all that. Uh, but yeah, this is why I, I, I want people to go out there and experience things, though, because other than that, every road trip I've been on, I have had a great experience with the fan bases that I was uh, interacting with. Speaking of road trips, it's not done. Going to a new place, uh, coming up, kind of tell the people what's what's going on in Jay Arnold's world. Yeah, uh, so it is Send Jay Away Week. Uh, earlier this year, I ran the second edition of the poll, uh, 68 games. The the users on Twitter have elected to send me to South Dakota School of Mines and Technology in Rapid City, South Dakota. Members of the Division Two RMAC Conference, Rocky Mountain Athletic Conference. Shout out, D2. Uh, so I am going up there to watch a game at O'Hara Stadium. Uh, if you haven't seen the stadium, look it up. It is really cool. We've got it tiered so you can actually like park and tailgate during the game. 
uh, and they encourage fans to to honk their horns on third downs. So I'm really excited to see that in person. Uh, the flip side of that too is uh, we ran a fundraiser last month to try to contribute to food banks around the country uh, and raised over eleven thousand dollars for for charity as as part of the Send Jay Away Week. Uh, so I'm I'm really excited about this road trip. I'll be leaving tomorrow to go up to Rockwall, spend a night with my folks, uh, and then just kind of shorten the drive from Rockwall. Mm-hmm. I'll go to uh, North Platte, Nebraska, is where yes, I said the stopping right. point would be. That's right. And then from North Platte, I'm going to go up to Wind Cave National Park there in southwest South Dakota, uh, then go to Rapid City, uh, spend the night Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights. I will be in Rapid City. Uh, there's a few other activities around that area planned but uh cannot wait for that game on saturday and then uh i'll hustle back sunday i think uh my stopping point for sunday was oklahoma city oh. uh, and then from oklahoma city i will drive back to houston so that we can record on monday <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you need an extra day just tell me uh i'm not trying to make you fall asleep or get hurt on the road there so so holler at me and we can record no, Tuesday, I especially mean- since they're coming off of a bye week uh, we can we can push that back if we need to. So don't <laughs> don't rush back on on my account. Uh, I always do believe though, like my fiance, soon to be wife, gets very mad at me on the few road trips that we've taken because we take our time there. And on the way back, I am ready to get home. I don't yeah. care how good of the thing that I was at, right? Like I will drive the whole way. Um, and so I do understand kind of the wanting to get back aspect. Um, that sounds like a really fun trip, man. That that's a beautiful part of the country. This is the time to go see it because in about a month, it won't be livable again. I don't know how people yeah. live up there 12 months out of the year. I mean, three weeks, two weeks. Yeah. Is, right, yeah. right. November 1st, basically, is is yeah. when your Halloween is the last day you want to be uh, above the Mason-Dixon line, in my opinion. If that can, I don't know. Maybe that's too far west to be above the Mason-Dixon line. Uh, but that is uh, it's too cold for me. But I think uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. Really unique stadium, as you mentioned. That's a, that's a good one. Last year, I feel like the people sent you – uh, on a on a wild goose chase out of some like you had much, you had better there was better games and better destinations than where you ended up i'm just gonna say that i don't want to throw anybody under the bus uh <laughs> but there there was there was better options out there i think that people did right by you on this one i'm excited to hear more about that road trip before we get out of here you had what is slightly controversial take on twitter uh where you kind of got fed up a little bit about people uh pretending as if their backyard barbecue is on par or better uh, than like these champion level barbecue places that are on the top 50 list sprinkled across this, the great state of Texas. Kind of what was your overall thoughts there? And what, what is the overall thing you need the masses to know uh, about barbecue here? Look, I understand if barbecue is too expensive for you, right? Oh, yeah. Like it is. I'm not expensive. saying, I'm not saying that you have to go uh, eat a steak every day either uh, you don't have to go find dining experiences every time and i understand that barbecue used to be more affordable right like it used to be kind of the cheaper cuts but that's not the case anymore yeah these barbecue supply joints, demand supply yeah. demand that's how this works they are dealing with you know just in huge prices there's a lot of labor that goes into it the people that are saying i can make better barbecue at home you may be able to cook one brisket yes and and make it great. Uh, these restaurants are doing like a thousand times that. Plus, they're making great sides that are probably better than what you're doing at home. Uh, a lot of times, like these home cook, it's like, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll smoke a brisket. Uh, can you bring something over to to go with it? And I'm like, mm-hmm. all right, well, and you know what's that? Like, obviously. It just bothers me because, like, I know how hard all these barbecue joints work on their craft and, and how much money goes. And, like, unlike, uh, you know, a certain coach that we talked about that's making millions, uh, these barbecue joints are not getting rich. Uh, yes. it, it is a pursuit of passion that, that labor is of not, love. yeah, that, that is that's not necessarily going to lend itself to you getting wealthy. Some folks get lucky, but nowhere near the amount of 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 other things uh and it, it just frustrates me when people come at it from an angle of well i can do better than this at home when in reality there's so many different things that go into it sure you may be able to have like one brisket that's excellent but when you're cooking for hundreds of people every day uh, every day and you have to deal with getting food from the suppliers and 
all of the minute issues that can go wrong uh, with a cook. I mean, I, I just I wish people had more of an appreciation for how much goes into being successful as a barbecue restaurant uh, more than just, oh, I can I can smoke a brisket or, or execute a cook for a couple of items. I'm a sports journalist that writes about football and I wasn't very good at football. So what I'm about to say is contradictory and I get it. Like I'm a talking head and that's all I do. So what I'm about to say, I, I realize I'm, I'm coming from a, a glass house here, but why do we care? Like, you know what I mean? Like I can make a better brisket. Okay. Go do it. Like who's nobody's making you go to these yeah. restaurants and go out or whatever. Just keep your mouth yeah, shut. Like, Just enjoy. Like, you know, when like, I who post, cares? like this is some of the best barbecue I had and some idiot is, right. is commenting. Uh, well, I can probably do better at home for cheaper. It's like, cool. Well, why are you here? Right. Go be broke at your house. And like, you know, like, oh, it's all fine. Like, I have no problem with it. Like, and I'm you not know, saying I'd... that you shouldn't cook for your friends and, and do yeah. stuff like that. Right. I mean, it is. I love that. Like, I, I wish I got to cook more. I, I would like to do that. I, I do enjoy an apartment. <laughs> I enjoy social media. And I think it's an overall net good for a lot of reasons. But like people just like to shit on stuff. Like there's just, you know, like you can be like, Hey, this is my beautiful mom. And all, you know, and there's like, ah, you know what I mean? Like you'd be like, I love pizza. And somebody's there to argue that hot dogs are better or something. It's just this whole culture of like nothing being cool. And like the cool thing being to like poop on every single person's like joy. Like, Oh, look how, look how awesome I am. Like this, that sucks. You know, everything sucks. It's like, okay, go be miserable by yourself. Like, this is why you can't go out and eat barbecue with me. You don't have anybody to go with. And so it gets very expensive. Uh, when you're by yourself, like, I just don't, I don't get it. That's why on Twitter, I recommend this to everybody. There are settings that you can use that keep it to where you do not see the mentions from people you don't follow or the people that don't have a real profile pic or people without a, you know, email address or whatever the settings that you need to do. I literally see none of it. Like I probably get cussed out every single day. Maybe I should see more, <laughs> more of it or whatever to help me do better at my job. But I don't see any of it. Cause like, you got to protect your mentals. Like Marshawn Lynch famously and beautifully protect said, chicken. You pre- yes, you just gotta do you, man. I just, I guess I've just never been somebody that likes to like poop on other people's fun. Like there's plenty of things that like, I don't get enjoyment of that everybody else does. And I just don't get why, why we have to, like go out of our way to tell people how much the thing that they like sucks. Like I just Let think people that's, enjoy things. Yeah. It's just so dumb. Like, and I get it if it's joking or something like that, but like, I don't know. It just seems lame. It just seems very lame is really, really what it does. And uh, we used to be a country that called out people for being lame and you can make it, make fun of people for being losers and dorks. And now you're not allowed to, and it, it bothers me. And that's why we have so many losers and dorks in the world as they're not allowed to get put into a toilet or given a wedgie when they're 13 <laughs> years old. and uh, bullying works. That's all I'd like to say on the, I, if anybody gets anything from this show, it's that bullying works. That's all I want anybody to understand here. <laughs> I can't really endorse that. Uh, bullying but... works, Jay. Bullying works, Jay. If more pe- if that dude at Louisiana who tried to flex his shirt off, if he had been bullied by you, he probably wouldn't be flexing his shirt. He probably he probably tried to fight like thirty more people, and had you just beat him up and put him in his place, like you would have been able to do thirty years ago, he would be done. He wouldn't be doing that anymore. He would have learned his lesson. Somebody needed to do that to him at twelve, but now CPS gets called, and you're not allowed to do anymore. That is my that is my old man rant of the day. <laughs> Got that out of the way, um, Jay. Appreciate it as always. Uh, glad you made it back safely uh, from Tennessee. Hope you make it to Dakotas uh, safely as well. That's going to be a, a fun trip. Take a lot of pictures. You can't send me the temperature anymore uh, because I won't be as jealous of that as I was uh, your last few trips. I actually probably would rather have the weather we're going to have in Texas than what yeah. you're going to than what you're going to see in the Dakotas. Yeah, but 60, uh, 65 and forty four, which is uh, right well, up. That's my not alley. bad. That's not bad. That is good. That is that is solid. What is your ideal? What's your ideal temperature before we get out of here? Like, if you could have the outside set like a thermostat, uh, at two p.m. Kind of what's the uh, what's the J Arnold perfect? It, it, it probably is about fifty five. If I, if I had to pick polar bear, Absolutely. I I like like being able to go like a hoodie and, and shorts, and fifty five is like that temperature for me. Yeah, 55 for me is a parka and some pants. Uh, I will take like 68, you know, uh, in that range, you know, with some sun outside. That to me is hoodie and shorts weather. Maybe in a couple of weeks it won't be. But when it first the first happens, like today I walked my dog and it was like 61 degrees outside. And it might as well have been snowing, you know, because we've been because <laughs> we've been living on the face of the sun 
for so long that that 60 degrees feels like it's freezing. Uh, but I guess like 88 feels like it's really hot when the summer starts kind of approaching up and then you're like praying for 88. So give my body a couple of weeks, maybe my blood will thicken and 60 won't feel as cold as it does right now. But anyway, Jay, appreciate you as always. Uh, great show. And, and like I said, uh, be safe, be safe on the road trip, man. That's the, the most dangerous thing you can do these days is drive. Uh, so be careful there. Yeah. I'll, you, I'll you try to avoid, I am not a speeder. Well, I like to do like five, yeah. five above. So like just that. a, so a comfortable not, not a speeder. real speeder. Yeah. 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 Just don't Especially drive in the left lane. The folks in Houston. Get out of the left lane. Everybody get out of the left yeah. lane. It's not for you to drive in. It's just to pass in. It should be empty. Otherwise, that's my other old man rant. All right. We'll get I, out of here before, on I, that one. <laughs> before I start going off on other things here. Uh, I'm trying. I, you can tell I don't want to write the story that I need to write when we're getting out of here because like I'm just trying. I'm, I'm doing my best to not land this plane. But we need to get out of here. Uh, please rate, subscribe, tell a friend, all that stuff. Republic of football, Dave Campbell's Texas football. Uh, we have a bunch of coverage up um, from the weekend at texasfootball.com. And we always do for Jay Arnold, for Mike Craven, uh, for Dave Campbell's Texas football. Talk to you next week.